on the live broadcast of the City of Refuge, Melbourne. This morning, I would just like to start by expressing from the very depth of my heart uh, gratitude and appreciation uh, to many of us who have worked so hard in spite of the circumstances and the situations uh, that we found uh, you know, ourselves or uh, that is happening all over the world in spite of the fact that we've not been able to meet as a congregation uh, since March this year. Many of us have worked so hard. Many of us have kept the flag flying. And this morning, from the depth of my heart, and I believe God wants to hear this, and I want to say thank you for everything that you've been doing. Specifically, I want to appreciate the multimedia. Uh, week in, week out, you work so hard to ensure that we are able to go live to the world. Uh, not just in the city of Melbourne, I can assure you, many people are watching beyond our city, even in Sydney, and also in the nations of the world. Multimedia department, Thank you for what you're doing. I want to also appreciate the children's church. You know, the children's teachers, you've done so well. Uh, many times, you do not see me there, but I always stay as a silent observer to the things going on there. And I listen to the way you teach those wonderful children. I just want to say thank you. You've been so good. Children's church, keep it up. And this is an opportunity to encourage parents if their children have not been attending children's church. Don't say, okay, I will wait until we resume. You don't have to wait. Children's church is already on. And as this on Saturdays at 10.30 a.m. every week, get your children there. The basic foundational principles that we have there, that will all go well for them in the days to come, in the years to come, that have been learned there. And I want to encourage you. Be there. Put them there. Because sometimes you can say, oh, I'm so busy. You know, these children. You know, God gave them to you as a blessing. He didn't give them to you as a God. And that is why you can't say, oh, they disturb the moon. I don't have time for them. We take time for them. You know, the Bible says that children are the very things of the Lord. Can I stop you? Yes, you can be the parents, but you don't own them. So the Lord will not forget the people of God. He will reward you. He will be up to what you are putting in. He will be up to what you are putting in. And on the other day, you will be up to stand for. Because God has not called the people that will be in. God has not called us to labor in pain. We will not labor in pain. We will not bring forth the trouble. We will have to go for your effort and for your labor. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. This morning I'll continue. The work I've been doing of what I said is to be back on practical principles for English. Practical principles for English. I started by looking at the foundational of the gospel. And then the week after, I go back the principle of honoring God. And then see, I've been looking at another key principle of things, which is the principle of each time and habit. Let me say this that in the life of a believer does not come by accident. It's not accidental. It just will not happen. And my habit is very vital, it's very important. That even though we stand here in prayer, prayers to be to act. If you pray and there's no action, I doubt you that you're truly praying. Because not in prayers, God will pray you. God will show you, do this, act this way, take this step, do it in this manner. Those are the actions of faith that produce results. And that is why there are three key premises that I'm basing this message on this morning. I want you to listen very, very carefully. Three. Three. 
But before I go to that, I'd like us to pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you this morning. We give you praise. We give you worship. We give you adoration. Thank you so much, O Lord, for bringing us together again to worship. For bringing us together again to spend time at the feet of Jesus. Lord, I pray, show us the things we need to know. Remind us of things we've learned that we've forgotten. And Lord, I pray that at the end of the day, we will have cause to glorify your name. Take us from where we are to where we ought to be in you. Lord, we want to thank you. Open over your people this morning, the heavenly portal, so that they can see the things that they need to see, so that they can walk in the light of your world to get to destination. We give you praise, we give you worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I mentioned earlier that this message will be built on three key premises. Number one, the principle of seed and harvest is universal. The principle of seed and harvest is universal. It applies to everyone, both Christians and non-Christians alike. This principle is irrevocable. There is no escape either for the believer or for the unbeliever. It is universal. It works in the lives of everyone. It will affect everyone equally. Whether you are a believer, whether you are not a believer, whether you are a Christian, whether you are not a Christian. It's just like the law of gravity. Gravity will apply to everyone. Gravity will affect anyone. It doesn't matter whether you are a believer or not. It's the same thing as the principle of seed, time, and harvest. The Bible says in the book of Galatians, chapter number 6, verse number 7, said, don't be deceived. Meaning that if you think it does not matter, then you are deceiving yourself. That don't be deceived. God is a mock. Whatever a man stores, that he will also read. Don't be deceived. God is no more. Whatever a man sows to us to reap, he does sows to his word. To his death, to affect the poor. The poor of you who sows to the to the faith, the everlasting life. What's the thing that you sow? He does sows to the That means he that invest all time in the new He that invest all time in the things of the natural, will eventually of the flesh report for us to understand that. Very, very interesting. Let us not grow weary. Because it is it, very vital and important. It's easy to become bored and say, Oh, I've tried. Oh, I've got that to do this. Oh, I must have a compensatory result. But what is funny? But let us not grow weary. What do you do? But in this case, there's a good thing. And a lot of the things. But don't let us give up. Don't become weary. Don't become tired. The efforts of putting the labels of the past, whatever you will do. That's why I deliberately was appreciated a lot of us who have been putting in so much effort to ensure that the work of God continues on in that in spite of the circumstances that we've been facing. It's just to let us know that the reward is coming. Or to let us know that the harvest is coming. It's called payday. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Number two is this. Harvest is always what? Greater than the sea. Or, I, I think number two should be, the harvest in life is a direct consequence of the seed you are sowing. Your harvest is a direct consequence of the seed you are sowing. Harvest is a direct consequence of the seed. Or to put it in a very, very, you know, simple way, you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Is it possible to sow cucumber? I want to reap pineapple. Hello? You went to the farm and say, oh, 
I don't have this to come up, but that's what I'm going to get. That's what I'm going to sow. And all that I'm expecting at the end of the day, you need pineapple. I love pineapple. I love purple. I love all these forms, but I'm going to go and sow all broccoli, and sow all cucumba, and sow what? Uh, no, you can't sow cucumba and eat pineapple. You need more to sow. So the harvest is as a direct consequence of the seed. Sometimes this is good news to some, and it's bad news to others, depending on the seed you have been sowed. Because when you are reminded, on the sea of Israel, I remember many, many years ago, many years ago, in my early years, you know, of Christian life, you know, my pastor there was sharing with us how somebody, he called somebody to his office, and he said, look, you know, you have done this, you have been doing this, you have been doing this, and the person said, no, that, that's not true, I didn't do anything like that, and I said, okay, what I'll just say is this, you have not done anything like that, what I want to say is this, Whatever you have been doing, you will be harvest of you. And he said, Are you passing me? I thought you were not doing anything. Then why would you not say that? I thought if you've not been doing, you should be okay, that's okay, that's you know, but he got angrier. And why should you say I should I would be harvest of the seed I've been sowing? Because of course it was clear to him he'd been sowing bad seeds. And he didn't want to leave the harvest of the bad seed he's been sowing. Your harvest is a direct consequence of the seed. I was praying this morning, and the Spirit of the Lord said this to me. He said, when you know that you have a harvest in your life, that you do not like, before you start to do anything, check the seed you are sowing. Whatever it is that you are experiencing, that you do not like, I don't like this situation. The first thing there is, check the seed that has been sown. Is there any time some seeds have been sown that is producing this harvest? Is there anything that could have done differently on the way these things have been done? Is there anything that I did that I should not have done or was done by others that is affecting me that should not have been done? Because things just do not happen for chance. This world is governed by forces. There's nothing like accident or poisonous in the spirit. There can be accident in the advanced learner's dictionary, but there's nothing like accident in the things of the spirit. The spirit realm is governed by forces. Many of them are not good, a lot of them are good, but depending on which forces is having the upper hand that will affect the experiences you have. Number three is this the harvest is always greater than the seed. Hello, the harvest is always greater than the seed. Why do farmers plant the seed and expect a huge harvest? Because they have these things very clear in their mind that sowing just a grain of corn can bring forth a huge harvest of leaves. Just this word, I've tried it before, I'm not telling you something about that. Just go ahead, just plant one. Just plant one. Put them up, put it in the ground. Or maybe a grain of beans. If you like beans, a grain of beans. Just put it in the ground. Or a grain of corn, put it in the ground. And you see the harvest that will come. It will never, never be just the one. There will be others. It will become sheaves of, 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 of maize. Or you know, many, many more of the seeds. If you want to really take my word for it, why don't you listen to Jesus? In John 12, verse number, on verse number 20, the Bible talks about some Greeks who came to him. And he said, you know, we want to see the master. We want to see him. And eventually they were taken. They met the three or took them to him. And then they this they saw him. And he mentioned this to them. John chapter number 12. And he said this. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came to worship at the feast. And they came to Philip, who was from the side of Galilee, and asked him, say, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And then Philip came and told Andrew, and he told Andrew to Jesus, to Philip, and he told Jesus, But well, Jesus answered them and said, and said, The hour has come, the Son of Man should be glorified. Now listen to this. Listen to this. Most assuredly, most assuredly, meaning certainly, meaning without 
any without any equivocation. I say to you, unless a grain of wood blows you up, falls to the ground, it, it dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forward. What grain will bring forth? What grain? What? Just a grain, 24. A grain of wheat. Just a grain of wheat will produce what? Much what? Much harvest or much grain the moment we force to the ground. The moment is planted, the harvest is always greater than the seed. Don't forget these three key places that this entire seed is built on. Now I want to take you to the scriptures where the expression or the principle of seed, time, and harvest is mentioned for the first time in scriptures. Let's go to the book of Genesis chapter number 8. Genesis 8, and I'll start to read it. From verse number 20 to verse number 20. I share with you three key premises on which the message has been based upon. And now I want to share with you three key principles of seed, time, and harvest. Verse number 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took every clean animal of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. 21. And the Lord smelled a soothing arrow when the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of a man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. 22. While the earth remains, seed, time, and harvest, cold, and heat, winter, and summer. Can you see? Something changed at this time. In by the introduction of different seasons of the day or different seasons in time, he was talking about four seasons in the day. This is actually the place where the entire day started for. God made a proclamation why the earth remains seed, time, and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not work, shall not cease. The three major principles of seed, time, and harvest. And I want to follow you very, very clearly. Number one is this. Number one, the principle of seed, time, and harvest was given to restore a flooded and devastated earth. The principle of seed, time, and harvest was given to restore a flooded and devastated earth. Let's go to verse number. Maybe we should go to verse number Genesis chapter 7. Let's read it from there. Genesis 7. Genesis chapter number 7. And we'll start to read from uh, maybe let's go to verse number where? Genesis chapter number 7 from verse number 1. It reads, and when the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household. Because I have said that you are righteous before me in this generation. If you look at, let me remind you of this particular incident in, in, in chapter 6. The Bible says Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. So it wasn't just as he was to find God for his acts, to find God for grace. Find God for grace. Grace, you know, grace gives you what you don't deserve. Grace will open the dimensions of every hope in your life. That makes it so as is it a level. That's why you must learn to tap into grace. Grace will release you to your life. God's grace is at as experts. Even at this time, before Christ came, the Bible said we have found grace in the sight of the Lord. Let's continue. Then the Lord, then the Lord said to Noah, okay, verse number two, you shall take with you several each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two of each animal that are unclean, a male and his female, verse number three, and also several each of the birds, male and female, to keep this species alive on the face of all the earth. For after several more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and I will not destroy from the face of the earth all the living things that I have made. Only will go and know I did that all that the Lord commanded him. Only will go want to destroy because the Bible says that the imagination in the hearts of men were evil continually. 
God will not want to stop the evil that was being perpetrated on the face of the earth. The evil taking place here. Oh, it doesn't matter. Anybody can just do anything. You can do. No, 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 no. The day of the economy is coming. The only thing now is that God is not going to use the floor to destroy the earth again. He said, I will never do that again. We, we saw that in Genesis chapter 8. Let's go to just chapter number 8 from verse number 13. He said, I will destroy, which he did. Then verse number 13 in Genesis 8. And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the earth. And look, and indeed, the surface of the ground was dry. Everything has been destroyed. The flood came as a judgment upon creation. Everything alive, apart from the thing that was in the ark, was saved. That is why I know that I know that I know. It does not matter what is happening to the ark. It doesn't matter what is happening to the world around you. If you are in the ark, you will be saved. But now, it's no longer the ark of Noah. It's Christ Jesus. Now, if you give your heart to him, if you belong to him, do you know that the same flood that destroyed all living things actually was the one that was lifted up the ark of what of Noah? Meaning that when others are saying we are cast out, you will say I'm lifted up. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. No one that God said to us that would be mad. Infinitely better. At the end of this than when the entire thing started. Is that your lot? Is that your portion? Do you receive it? If you receive it, then you shout hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. And if you those like the words of God, you are not the words, you are not, you are not my words. That we will emerge infinitely better. That's why I'm so confident to declare it all the time. Infinitely better. And not just that, the book of testimony is now already happening. I'm telling you, God is a work. I can't give you the lot of details because they will come by share the testimonies themselves at the appropriate time. Amen. Because it's not just about me, it's about what God is doing in the life of his people. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. It came to pass. So we remove the covering of the ark and look. Indeed, the surface of the ground was dry. Verse 14. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the ark was dried. Verse 15. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Yes. Get go out of the ark, you and your wife, your sons and your sons' wife with you. <laughs> Bring out of with you, every living thing of all flesh that is with you. What? That's true. Every creeping thing that creeps on the earth so that they may abound on the earth. Because by this time, everything has been destroyed. And the fruitful are multiplied on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons, and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every animal, every creeping thing, every bird. Whatever creeps on the earth, and everything the families went out of the earth. Because everything that was outside of the earth had been destroyed. Verse number 20. Now, but Noah, Noah, then Noah did what? Built an altar to the Lord, took every clean animal, every clean bird, offered and offered both offerings on the altar. How come that? Note that. Then the Lord swear a certain animal. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again cause the ground for man's sake. Although the imaginations of man's heart is what? Evil for his youth. The reason why the ark was destroyed in the first instant. Why the ark remains. Seed. Everybody say seed. Time. Harvest. Cold. Eat. Winter. Summer. Day. Night. Shall not cease. Why the earth remains. So he gave them that principle to restore the flooded and the devastated earth. And now listen to this. This is by the unction of the Holy Spirit. You can use the same principle to restore whatsoever the enemy had God deformed. Whatever the enemy had destroyed in your life. You can start to take this principle of seed, time, and harvest and start to walk in it and start to walk 
on it and start to apply it to your life. And every matter that has been restored, God says He will restore. A few weeks back, He woke me up in the area of the morning and He said to me, There's nothing that you cannot change. He said, There's nothing that you cannot cause to be restored. All the way, is to start the plans we see in my world very deep into your heart. And by the time you start to plan that, it will bring forth a harvest of the promise I've given to the that world. And when you take the world and you start to plant it as a seed and cause it to go well, deep. Because if the thing is superficial, the enemy can still steal them. Don't forget the parable of the sower. It can still steal them. Because by the time you start to bombard your heart with feelings, we can you say this? Oh, this thing, or this one, and that one. But if the thing is going deep, oh, when the enemy will come like a flood. The Bible says the Spirit of the Lord will raise up what is standard in it, do you see? That's why you must plant it deep into your heart. Deep in your heart. Why will God give them this principle immediately after the earth has been flooded and destroyed? Because it's so powerful. Can I call it the mother of all principles? Is the principle, is the major principle of the kingdom of God. Seed and harvest. Or so we are plenty. Is the, is the fundamental principle of the kingdom. Fundamental principle of the kingdom. And you can use it to restore any devastation. Take the world or start to plant the seed in your heart, in your life, and eventually restore what Satan has what destroyed. Number two. Let's go to verse number 20. God spoke to Noah. And Noah got out of the ark. Then Noah, look at the first thing that Noah did. Noah built an altar to the Lord. Noah built an altar to the Lord. Your giving is part of your worship. Your giving is part of your worship. The first thing that Noah did was to build an, an altar to worship God with. Your giving is part of your worship. Whatever sin you are sowing, especially when you are asked to give. Oh, oh yeah, maybe they don't want this. No, your giving is part of your worship. The first thing that you did, let's learn from him. He built an altar to the Lord and then took of every clean thing. God said to him, let all the animals go out so that there can be a regeneration or a restoration of everything that has been destroyed. And Noah did not rush into that. What did he do first? He got out and built an altar to the Lord. You will give him his of your worship. When you bring forth your seed, whatever seed you are bringing forth is an expression of worship. It's an expression of worship. So when people refuse, when, when the Bible says we should give a heart to Jesus, is the is the is the radical expression of our worship to Him. When you bring your finances to Him, is an expression of your worship to Him. So when you don't know that, you say that God you deserve my worship. When people say that they're not willing to give their heart to the Lord, what are they saying? The Lord does not deserve what? The worship. When you say, I'm not going to give my finances to Him, what they're saying is that your finances, you're not going to worship your finances. Don't forget the habit is dependent on what you see. And the is always dependent than what you see. Number three. Number three is this. To reap an abundance of harvest, the seed will be sacrificial. To reap an abundance of harvest, the seed must be what? Sacrificial. There's something about sacrifice that touches God. Let me say this. Let's very, 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 very,
hear this truth, there's something about sacrifice that touches God. When you go and say, I want to spend time in pain and fasting, what are you doing? Sacrifice. There's something about sacrifice that touches God. Then you have built an altar to the Lord. And look at what we are doing. And took of every what? Clean animal. Of every clean bird. And offered burnt offerings on the altar. And many animals were actually available to Noah at this time. How many? The God told him, take several of clean animals and two of unclean animals. And now, the Bible says, he took of every clean animal. And of every clean bird, and offered them offerings on the altar. So it was easy for Noah to say, okay, well, when, let, let, <laughs> because he took of the seven clean animals and the seven clean birds, and he offered it to God. It would have been easier for Noah to say, okay, let's see what happens first. And then we can now offer something to you, O oh Lord. But before doing anything, but before anything, he took of the end every king armor, whatever you can, in the rational, in the natural people will say, why don't you take time? Or why don't you give the middle? And then just give the each away. But Lord took of every king animal. It was a sacrificial duty by Noah. It was a sacrifice that he brought to God. Let me say this. There are three key areas of sacrifice for the believer. Three key premises. Three major principles. And three areas of sacrifice. Three. Number one area that God will require sacrifice from you is the sacrifice of your body. The sacrifice of our bodies. Romans chapter 12 from verse number 1. Romans 12 verse number 1. What does that mean? I beseech you therefore, brethren. What does the word beseech mean? I... Somebody said I beg you. But, but that, that, that is not too far for me. Can you imagine the Spirit of God begging us? Can you imagine that I beg you? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your word, your bodies be given sacrifice. Meaning that the moment you are a believer, the moment you are giving your heart to Him, He expects you to present your body to Him as a living sacrifice. So that body cannot be violated. That body cannot just be used anyhow. Four or five years ago, I joined in the March, March for Babies. It was in Victoria. We have one of the most amazing laws of abortion in the Australia. Here in Victoria, the law says that you can abort the baby in the proper school time. You can abort. That is completely wrong. And in that match, there were people who are there. Why you are saying it's reasonable for babies? But there were people who are there who are saying, My body, my blood, I can do anything with me. My body, my blood. And you say, Oh, yes, it might be your body. But someone gave it to you. Someone gave the body to you. You know, it, 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 it didn't just come there and then manufacture the dead body the way you desire it. And if you are giving, it means that there's a responsibility that the giver of the body will expect from you. And as believers, God is saying to present your bodies. You can't live your life or do anything with that body. You can't violate that body. You can't use it anyhow. God expects us to present our bodies as a living son. Unacceptable to God. Whatever you want to do to that body, check your spirit. Is, am I, can I just do this to this body? Because that body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Would the Holy Spirit live inside of the body, of the body, to whatever that body? A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to what? 
to God. Number one, have you the only duty of God? Present it as holy. Number two, present it as acceptable, meaning that whatever I want to do to it, is it acceptable to Him? Number three, it is your what? It is the most service to Him. And it says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present it. You can't just do anything to your body, you can't live anyhow with that body. Amen. You can violate that body. He is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is living inside of you. Number two, the sacrifice of our finances. I'm going to go more into that next week when I start to look at the principle of stewardship. The sacrifice of our finances. <laughs> and let's go to the book of Philippians, chapter number four. Philippians chapter number 4 on verse number 15. What does it say? Now the Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving the new only. Isn't that interesting? No church shared with me concerning giving and receiving except the church in the heart. Let's continue. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessity. That's all. Verse number, let's continue. Verse number 17. Not that I seek work, I don't seek a gift from you, but I seek fruit or I, that abounds in your what? Your account. Can you have fruit without seed? So, what was he telling them? Because you have planted, I want you to plant your seed so that you can have what? Fruit abounding to what you are count. Is it possible to go to a farm to want to harvest when you have not planted anything? Can you just take over and say, I'm going to this board? They have farmlands there. I'm going to go and harvest. They have big farmlands with pineapple and everything there. I want to go and harvest and bring them home. If you do that and enter somebody else's farm, what do you think they will do to you? They will say, oh, you are welcome, so I will be waiting for you. Is that what, you, what they will do? What are you doing when you, if you should do that? You are trespassing. What do they do to trespassers? Trespassers are prosecuted. Because you are trespassing. So you don't go to somebody else's farm to harvest when you have not planted what? Planted seed. So he said, I'm seeking, not that I seek a gift from you, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. This is one of the most challenging. Have you noticed? Can I be very frank with you? Have you noticed that there seems to be more people in the world who seems to be so wealthy than in the church? Somebody said, no, no, no. And the Bible says that God does not want us to have money. Where did you read that from? I said, where did you read that from? You know, the challenge we have is this. The challenge we have is that messages have been preached in church concerning God's prosperity for the believer that is not from the Holy Spirit. We have emphasized what is called materialism, not prosperity. Materialism is from the flesh. When the desire is our prosperity is our yielding whatever we have to God so that God can use his kingdom, starting with us. Starting with us. He said, I seek the food that abounds in your account. Let's continue, verse number 18. He now says this, Indeed, I am all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things good, a sweet smell aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing word. And what is it? An acceptable word? Sacrifice. What did we see again? That you present your body a living what? Sacrifice. And I'm full, and having received from Epaphroditus the things sent for you, a sweet I 
If you are expecting a bountiful harvest, then you must be willing to what to live sacrificially. Give sacrificially. Live your life sacrificially. Present your body as a living sacrifice. Number three, the sacrifice of praise. Sacrifice of praise. Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 15. Sacrifice of praise. What is the sacrifice of praise? You know, it's not just we bring the sacrifice of praise unto the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise unto the house of the Lord. Then, you know, when we are enjoying this, we will not shake our head as we offer to thee the sacrifice. Sees some of us will even dance, you know. <laughs> Praise the name of you know how you dance, amen. <laughs> As we offer to thee the sacrifice is all who can even call us who is wonderful is Jesus, who is beautiful is Jesus, who is glorious is Jesus, who is powerful is he shout hallelujah, hallelujah, shout hallelujah, hallelujah, shout hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, say wow what a powerful time of praise oh yes i do not doubt that it's powerful time of praise but it's not necessarily sacrifice of praise what is the sacrifice of praise the sacrifice of praise is when even though things are not going the way you are what you maybe you believe they should go maybe you received not a good result maybe new, uh, bad news have just come maybe something that just happened to you not necessarily edifying that you were not expecting what does god expect from us at that time just remember that your god is faithful remember that god is good and instead of complaining instead of feeling bad instead of feeling so sad instead of feeling oh yes look at what has happened blah 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 what do you do at that point that you lift up your hands and start to give to him and start to praise him when you seem to be bombarded by this attack by that attack when it seems as if it's difficult for you to pray when it's like i, I don't know what to do i can't pray again especially when you are faced with multiple attacks challenges here and there it's no longer time to pray it's time to praise that is sacrifice of praise when you know even though you don't feel like it even though you don't want to do it even though the circumstances do not look like it even though they are not encouraging for you to do it what do you do you lift up your hand and start to walk, worship him and offer him praise and praise him and bring to him to all to him sacrifice of praise telling him that you know of that lord i know that in spite of it all oh that oh i know that you will come through for me oh that i know that i will make it i know that i will i will stand that no matter what comes my way my my life is in your hands then you start to say that oh yes and you start to minister to yourself like david the bible said david encouraged himself in the law you start to give him sacrifice of praise at the same time minister to yourself that you don't have to worry <laughs> don't you be afraid joy comes in the morning trouble they don't last always in jesus 
Wipe off your ass away, away from this problem. Just lift your hands and say, oh, I know that I will make it. I know that I will stand. No matter what may come my way, my life is in your hands. Can I tell you something? The moment you start to do that, you know what? You start to reposition things. You start to reshape things. Because when prices go up, presence comes down. Angels are released from heaven. Who will not start to work on those circumstances to change them, to transform them? That's the same thing that happened to Jehoshaphat when he was bombarded by all the people from Mount Seir. Oh, and all these other people that gathered together against him. He didn't know what to do. He gathered himself in praying and fasting. Remember I said, if you're truly praying, you must produce what? Action. In the place of prayers, God spoke to them. It now start to praise, start to give praise, start to worship. It was a sacrifice of praise. And you know what Jehoshaphat said? He said, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, you shall prosper. And he started singing praises. And started singing to the Lord, worshiping him. And the Bible says, God sent ambushment against their enemies. Why? Because when praises go up, presence comes down. Especially sacrifice of praise. Sacrifice of praise. When you seem to be way down, when you don't even know what to do, when you seem to be bombarded left, right, and center, it's time to word, it's time to lift up your voice and start to praise him. And do you know what happened? At that point, Satan has thrown to you his biggest punch and was expecting to be folded and be weighed down and be down and be crying and be doing all of that. But suddenly, instead of that, you lift up your heads, lift up your hands and start to praise. You will confound him. Heavens will know that say, yes, that's my son there. That's my daughter there. And you, there will always be a response. There will always be a response. There's something about sacrifice that touches heaven. Three areas of sacrifice. Your body. Number two, your finances. Number three, sacrifice of praise. Why is it that sacrifice touches God so much? Because it's showing to him that we are being conformed to the image of Christ. It's showing to him that we are being conformed to the image of Christ. It's, oh, it's like affirming to him that we are being like God himself. Oh yes, for God so loved the world that he what? He gave his only begotten son. He could have sent angel Gabriel. He could have sent angel Michael. And he would still have the son. But he gave everything. It was sacrificed for him. And the Bible says, look at the harvest. Billions and billions of believers who have actually come from that singular sacrifice. Not only that, let's look at Jesus. Ephesians chapter 5 verse number 2. There's something about sacrifice that is always so touching to the heart of God. Ephesians 5 2. And what what? In love. As Christ has also what? Loved us. And given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smell. Can you see it? Whenever the sacrifice is smelly, I mean pleasing. The Bible says it is what? Sweet smelling. We saw it in Genesis, sweet smelling. We saw it in Philippians, sweet smelling. We, we again see it here. So that means God said, mm, 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 That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. We know, we know what I'm talking about. Or maybe men too will know what I'm talking about. You know? But when, the, when, when there's good aroma coming from the place, you see? Mm. And do you know one thing? It doesn't even matter whether you can cook or not. At least you can smell. Mm. There's a sweet smelling aroma coming. That means whenever we do this sacrificially, God says, hmm, something is coming out there. Amen. It shows God that we are being conformed to the image of Christ. Sacrifice something that is so close to the heart of the Father. And in the same way, we cannot afford to live a life of indulgence. We can't live a life of indulgence. We are called to live our lives sacrificially.
Can I be very honest with you? Anytime God is calling you up, at the same time, there's always a condition attached to it. And what is that condition? What are you going to lay down on the altar as a sacrifice? Anytime God is calling you up, anytime, maybe calling you up spiritually, maybe calling you up financially, in whatever area, what follows is this. What are you going to lay? And that is why when God wanted to save the world, what did he do? He gave his only son as a sacrifice. When God is calling you, asking you to increase yourself spiritually, there's something that he's also asking you to sacrifice. Maybe sacrifice some time. Maybe sacrifice, maybe time spent with friends. Time spent with what? Friends. Maybe time spent with what? Netflix. Maybe time spent with what? There's something that you have to give up. Something that you have to say, I need to cut this off a little bit more. I can't afford to do this. And you know, whenever that is done, there's always what? Sacrifice will always provoke divine response. Let me take you back to Genesis chapter 12, I mean 20, uh, Genesis chapter 8, and then I will end there. It will always provoke divine word response. From verse 20. Genesis 8, 20. After Noah gave sacrificially, God responded by giving a promise to know and to all mankind. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. 21. And the Lord again smelled what? A soothing aroma, a sweet smelling aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will not again. Look, how, look at that. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again. That's a, that's a proclamation. As a result of that sacrifice, look at what he provoked. God said, I will never again. What? Cause the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's heart is what? Evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. And then now, while the earth world remains. While the earth world remains. Seed, time, and harvest, cold, and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not work cease. It will always, the Bible says by the mouth of two or more, every word shall be established. Let me take you to Second Chronicles chapter 1, from verse number 4. I will, I will show you something there again also. That any time there's a sacrifice made in line with what God is asking you for, it will always provoke divine response. Second Chronicles chapter 1, on verse number four, but David had brought up the ark of God from Kajath Jerim to the place David had prepared for it, for he had pitched a tent for it at Jerusalem. Now the bronze altar that Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hor, had made, he put before the tabernacle of the Lord. Solomon and the assembly sought him what? There. Yes, verse 6. And Solomon went up there to the bronze altar before the Lord, which was at the tabernacle of meeting, and offered a thousand bond offerings on it. It was something that Solomon did not imagine. A thousand bond animals. Just imagine that. It was something that Solomon didn't have to offer. A thousand. Maybe a few animals will have done the job. But Solomon went what? Beyond and above. It was a sacrificial giving from Solomon. And Solomon went up there to the bronze altar before the Lord, which was at the tabernacle of meeting, and offered a thousand bond offerings on it. Don't forget what I said. That word. Your, the harvest is always what? Greater than the word, the seed. And the harvest is determined by what? By the sea. On that night, everybody see that night. Not even the four, two weeks after. Hello. On that same night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask, what shall I give you? This is a blank check. Ask, what shall I give you? Same night, God appeared to him. What Solomon did provoked divine response. And God said, Ask. 
what shall I give to you? You know the whole story. He asked for wisdom. And he became not just the wisest, but the richest king ever in the entire history of the nation of Israel. Up till today. Up till today. But what provoked that is sacrificial giving. What is God asking you to lay down on the altar of sacrifice? Seed, time, and what? Harvest. What is it? He's asking to lay down. Is it your life? Is it your time? Is it your finances? Seed, time, harvest. What is it that God is asking from you? When you listen to him, it will provoke divine response. That will go beyond and above. You will now realize that wait a minute, that the harvest from the seed you have laid down cannot be compared at all to the harvest that is bringing to you. Because the harvest is always greater than the seed. The principle of seed, time, and harvest. When you have been asked to lay some things down, maybe it is your time, television time, that says stop that. Stop watching during this particular period so that you can invest it in this. Stop doing this one so that you can invest that in this. Stop with this one so that you can invest that in it. At that point in time, it's like a huge sacrifice for the time of harvest is coming. And the time of reward is coming. When you now say, wow, I'm God that I will be. In fact, you now say, maybe I should have even gone more. Because look at the harvest that came from just the one that I've done. I believe that well, that's what God is saying to us as a church. That it's time to start to live our lives sacrificially. It's time. What is God asking you to give sacrificially? It will not be the same thing for everyone, but there's something that God will require from you. Maybe it's even something requiring. Maybe it's because of you that I brought this message today. Or maybe this is to prepare you for what He will ask you in the days to come. When you say, lay this down for me. Lay that down for me. Sometimes it might even be maybe a relationship you should not be involved with. And he said, no, stop going with this person. You can't go with this person. He's not my child. And he said, if the person should go, where am I going to find another person? Why don't you trust him that God is able to give you that perfect person? That will be the bone of your bones and the flesh of your flesh. What is it that God is asking you to lay down what is it? What relationship is it? Don't go. Don't, don't do that. This person, oh, but he's very nice. He's, he's, he's so gentle. He speaks so sweetly. Of course, nobody gives poison plain to anyone. He's always put in a very good jollof rice or fried rice or in a very good meal. Because nobody will just take poison and swallow it. Except you want to know right thinking person, I should say. But it's always put in a very good, maybe it is put in chapati or put in a, a in uh, put in a, a you know, all those things. Pack it together there. Uh, in, uh, yes, in puff puff or whatever. Put it there. And then you say, oh, because he knows that you like puff puff or you like uh, bones or you like chapati or you like all those ones. So hmm, the moment you say, <laughs> but meanwhile, in it, you have that packing. You know, you would not go there if it were just a poison. So, what is it that God is asking you to lay down? My dear ones, it is time lay it down so that you can imagine infinitely better at the end of this period than when it all started. It is time. It's going to swing up some doors of opportunities that will shock you. It's going to release some dimensions of favor into your life that you would never thought possible. It's going to take you to heights beyond and above what you can ever think or ask. That is what God 
is saying to us this morning. It is time. We lay it down so that God himself can start to walk and put in place the thing that he wants to do in your life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. Thank you so much, O oh Lord my God, for everyone under the sound of my voice. Thank you because your word, you've given us this word to encourage us, to challenge us, to help us, to reposition us so that we can start to walk in the light of the things that you desire from us. And so that we can also lay hold the harvest that you have in store for us. We've seen that harvest is not accidental and it's not coincidental either. But Lord Jesus, you always require from us to lay down, to come, to bring a seed, whatever, asking us that will eventually produce the harvest. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. Let no one be hard hearted. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that this word, O oh God, will start to cause that repositioning so that your people can come into the fullness of that which you have desired and ordained for them. Thank you, Lord, for the rest of the day. I commit each person into your hands. Lord, I pray, O oh God, that this word will continue to resonate in the hearts of people throughout today throughout this week, none will be forgetful, but all will be doers of the work. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people said, and the people said, don't forget, what area is God asking you to lay down the sacrifice before him? It's between you and him, but it's time to be. Amen? God bless you. And I'll see you during the week, and then ultimately on Sunday. We'll see you again.